In this ninth tape, we're taking up the decrees of God in the rational biblical theology of Jonathan Edwards. You remember the opening tapes after sketching his life dealt with his view of philosophy, reason, and revelation, and especially the inspiration of the Bible. With our last lecture, we began his theology proper with a consideration of his main depicting of the nature of God and the Trinity. Now I take up the topic of God's decrees in this tape number nine. The rational biblical character of Edwards's theology is clear even when he presented unconditional election. There is a sense in which reason is even elevated above revelation. God has, says Edwards, reasons for choosing some to eternal life rather than others. These reasons, however, are above us. God does not seek our counsel. But Edwards is trying to remind his hearers that uh, though God's decrees are sometimes called arbitrary, and Edwards himself will use that term, and that means of God's will alone. Arbitrium is the word for will, and these are decrees or determinations or decisions of things to come determined by the sheer will of God. He stresses at the same time that though it is traceable to the arbitrary will of God, that will of God, which is arbitrary, is also rational. That he has reasons for choosing some and not others, and for choosing Jacob and not Esau and Peter and not Judas and so on. God hasn't taken leave of his mind, as it were, when he makes his decisions. I'm laboring this, though it's very obvious to Reformed thinkers that this is the case, because Reformed decrees are usually condemned for this very reason that they are arbitrary. And while we defend the arbitrariness of them in the sense that they come from the arbitrium or will of God, that is usually taken to mean anti-rational. And we're pointing out that the will of God is not opposed to the mind of God, and that he had reason for saving some and not others, and saving the ones he saved and not the others. A glance now at divine election. Jesus Christ, writes Edwards, is the great medium and head of union in whom all elect creatures in heaven and earth are united to God and to one another. Again, he writes, the saints are those that God has chosen out of all the world to be for him as his part and portion. The Edwards was steward when he was uh, a student at college and he often refers to that illusion as a steward, as a person who must distribute to those whom he serves. And God distributes to mankind. And as, in a sense, he's also the recipient of mankind. And here, Edwards is entertaining the idea that God's portion, that's, as it were, allotted to God is his people and the angels in heaven as well who stood. Again, true Christians are a chosen generation. Edwards insisted in his early sermon on 1 Peter 2, 9. At the same time, Edwards declared that as truly as God appointed the elect to show forth the glory of his grace, just so deliberately did he appoint, quote, the damnation of the wicked on purpose to show forth his glory. 
Do you get that? Let me repeat once again. At the same time, Edwards declared that as truly as God appointed the elect to show forth his glory of his grace, just so deliberately did he appoint the damnation of the wicked on purpose to show forth this glory. How so? This had the effect on the godly of their prizing God's favor to them all the more. He would develop the idea that we do appreciate what we have even more when we see those who do not have it. And he doesn't hesitate to say that hell makes heaven all the happier. That is, heaven realizes there, but for the grace of God, go I. That is what I deserve. And the fact that I am here rather than there is because of the grace and mercy of God and only because of the grace and mercy of God. And that, of course, enables those in heaven to appreciate that inestimable gift all the more. And Edwards is hitting at God's ultimate purpose in the damnation of the wicked is the enhancement of the blessedness of the elect. From my childhood up, my mind had been full of objections against the doctrine of divine sovereignty. You remember how we went into that when we were discussing Edwards' view of sovereignty? And let me remind you once again, he traced his own conversion to the acceptance of a doctrine which for years he had called horrid. The doctrine that damned some and actually saved others was for many years what kept Jonathan Edwards out of a firm faith in the Christian religion. And it was only when he came to realize that this which he had called horrid was supremely sweet and blessed in the purpose of God that his conversion actually took place in that realization. Permission is a word which Edward uses frequently when he's talking about God's decreeing of evil. He doesn't author it. He's not the positive cause of it. But he has decreed that it will come to pass in a way that permits persons to choose to do that which they, of themselves, choose, not because they are pushed into it, or persuaded against their judgment, but because they are inclined to it according to their judgment. God could prevent it. He has no obligation to do so, and he chooses not to do so in the case of reprobates, just as he chooses to do so in the case of those whom he's chosen to eternal life. Permission loomed large in Edwards' discussion of the decrees, though God was always in perfect control of anything he permitted to happen, including sin, especially including sin. Man's fall was intended that God might glorify himself this way by manifesting his mercy and just wrath. He permitted the fall, and he permitted the fall because as a result of it, he was through the redemption of some and the non-redemption of others going to reveal more clearly his glory in his mercy and in his wrath. I may uh, take a precious minute or two here to tell you a little experience I had that a sort of humorous thing, but it may enable you to remember. Gerstner mentioned this because it was relevant to the uh, 
radical theology of Jonathan Edwards, but I use this word in a little primer I wrote many years ago on predestination. And some people who were hostile to me uh, wrote to the seminary where I was the only militant Calvinist. There were other conservatives on the faculty, but I was the only one who was reminding my colleagues that the Westminster Confession of Faith, which we professed to believe, taught the doctrines which they were opposing. But I did in my little primer mention the fact that God permitted evil and some people from outside who felt that Calvinism could never allow this term wrote me a letter that they duplicated for every other member of the faculty censoring me because I use that word and they did everything but call me an Arminian because I use that word. Of course, all my colleagues who always saw me as a champion of orthodoxy were delighted with that letter. and They te teased me all around the block about my Arminianism and such things as that. But the point is, the word permission is a standard word in Reformed doctrine of decrees. There are Reformed people who will always use the word positive rather than permissive, but they're in a decided minority. They are Calvinists to be sure, but they're a rare commodity. Most Calvinists do, as Jonathan Edwards does, and if I may so, John Gerstner also does, use this word. But what we're stressing now, and the reason I mention that personal episode is that this is absolutely consistent with this and with this. God decrees everything that comes to pass without producing the sin he decrees, but letting it come to pass according to the circumstances he has ordained, infallibly fulfilling the determinations he has made by permitting persons of evil disposition to make evil choices. See, I'm trying to say decrees and permission are not mutually exclusive propositions and that most Reformed people are like Edwards on this matter, and Edwards' Calvinism in this area is absolutely indisputable in saying that the decrees of sin are determined by God permissively, without, as Westminster Confession would say, without any violence to the will of the creature. Arminians have a hard time understanding that, but at least it must be understood that this is what Calvinism teaches, that God decrees everything that comes to pass, including sin, but without any violence to the will of the creature, he does it permissively. The idea of holding both of these concepts is difficult for some people. They can't hold this and that, well, they, if they hold this, that this has to go, or if they hold a positive decree or decrees at all, then any kind of freedom on the part of men has to be sacrificed on that altar, they think wrongly. God decreed the fall of man, yet Edward sees this as anti-supralapsarian. As we shall see when we come to the Edwardsian doctrine of man, the Holy Spirit was a kind of super added gift, and Adam's failure to call upon the Holy Spirit was the occasion of the fall. In a sense, God permitted Adam not to call on the Holy Spirit, who was made immediately available to him. And this gets us into the arguments of, about infra and supra lapsarianism. Those of you who haven't heard the word before, infra simply means that God decrees after or considering the fall as having 
taken place so that when God decrees, he decrees concerning fallen people, sinful people. Others, and Edwards is often thought among these, are supralapsarians who say, no, God decrees everything before the fall is even before his mind. Supralapsarian. I'm trying to say, I can't have time to prove it here as I try to do in the book itself, that in spite of strong language, which suggests to many people that God decreed sin even when man was, un, was, uh, was upright and that he actually did, in a sense, produce the fall when man was actually unfallen, that that is a minority viewpoint and that Edwards actually shares the fundamentally popular or majority viewpoint, but again, connected with the concept of forgiveness, of uh, uh, permission. Among his far less voluminous writings, Edwards has far more than two explicit references plainly asserted that it is certain that God did not intend those that he knew from all eternity to be saved. See, this raises the question about the divine intention with respect to certain persons who perish. This is a very contemporary struggle, even among the best of Reformed theologians. But Edwards is simply saying here, it is certain that God did not intend to save those that he knew from all eternity would not be saved. See, this brings the decrees right down to the level of human choice and human decision and divine intention. And the question is, if a person believes in the decrees of God and he decrees that some shall be saved and some shall perish, what does he intend when the gospel is offered to a mixed assortment of sinners and saints, or elect and non-elect. People tend to curl up and die on this one, and no one wants to say, God does not intend the salvation of reprobates, of those who had not been decreed to be saved. God does not intend the salvation of reprobates. Now Edwards is saying that's perfectly obvious, that he didn't give his son to save people whom he knew would never be saved. What's the purpose of the offer of the gospel? We'll look at that in more detail later, but it is certainly not to save the Esau's and the Judas's. Edwards is simply saying, God knew, and he had decreed they wouldn't be saved. So why in the world would he intend it? He also, in other places, mentions the fact that if God intended something that he wasn't able to accomplish, he would never be the ever-blessed God we read about. In the last lecture, he would be the ever miserable God, suffering an eternal frustration in the damnation of the wicked whom he intended to save but was unable to do. Edwards is loud and clear on this subject, where even Calvin was not nearly as emphatic as he could have been, though that he taught the same doctrine, and Augustine even more clearly is indisputable, but I'm just simply saying here, with respect to the decrees of God, with respect to the salvation of men, Edwards does spell out the permissive decrees, but permissive decrees that the wicked should not be saved. If I've satisfactorily shown that in spite of much opinion to the contrary, 
Edwards was infralapsarian. It's even easier to prove that he believed in eternal reprobation. The notion that single predestination, you probably have heard that freely used term these days, the notion that single predestination, the vague theory that the Bible teaches only predestination to life, election, and not to death, reprobation, is taught by infralapsarians is certainly refuted by Jonathan Edwards. While believing that the decree of evil is a permissive decree, he argues, as we have seen, that this is most certainly the will of God. Very hard to face these things, and this is one of the things about Edwards that makes him especially important. He didn't shrink back from declaring the whole counsel of God. This is Gerstner right now and not Edwards, though I think Edwards would agree. The Apostle Paul, who's the author of that language, said, I am innocent of the blood of all men because I didn't hesitate to proclaim the whole will of God, which is the same thing as saying on the part of the Apostle Paul, if I had shrunk back out of fear of disfavor or rejection or displeasure or whatever, and if I had shrunk back from declaring the whole counsel of God, which is the salvation of the elect and the damnation of the reprobate, I would not be innocent of the blood of all men. If people perish, I say as one minister to Christian ministers who may be listening to these tapes or watching them, if we are guilty, gentlemen, of not declaring the whole counsel of God, if I understand the Apostle Paul, and people perish because of it, we're going to perish with them. Jonathan Edwards was ever guilty of that particular crime. I think it's very evident. In the sermon on Psalm 106.5, Edwards finds that God chooses some and rejects others. He goes on to say the rest of the world, apart from the elect, is treated by God as, quote, worthless. For Edwards, gaining the whole world is not only not worth losing the soul, but in itself, it's actually worthless. All that the world holds dear, God and Jonathan Edwards consider cast off. I don't think in Edwards' day they had an income tax which determined a human American being's worth by his money, as we crassly do today. What are you worth means how many dollars do you have in the bank? This world apart from Christ, according to Jonathan Edwards, and I believe according to the Bible as a whole, is absolutely worthless. What does it profit a man? Here's a straightforward, capitalistic, evangelistic call of Jesus Christ. You people who put a premium on what the earth can give and what honor the world can bestow, I'm asking you, what profit is it to you if you gained the whole world and lost your soul? You'd gain something which at its maximum is totally worthless. And for that gain, you would have actually earned eternal damnation. As I say, Edwards is never more rational than when he shows. <laughs>
the folly of human sin and wickedness. And the thing I'd like you to remember in this mini lecture here on his decrees, and it is really a mini lecture because he has whole essays on the subject, and it loomed large in his preaching. And it's one of the evidences of the answer to the question which I'm often given, if you believe in predestination, why do you preach? He showed that belief in predestination is what leads a person to preach, that God is going to bring to pass what God has decreed from all eternity should come to pass. But as a realist and honest biblical scholar that he was, being persuaded that most of mankind were going permissively, according to a divine decree, choose to remain on that broad road on which they were born as it led them to eternal destruction. And that only if we get off that worthless road that's so thronged with so many people and their way to eternal destruction, we will perish with them. And it will be no surprise to God. It will be a working out of the decree of God. And God will be infinitely angry with you if you remain on that. Because though he has decreed what you have done, he has decreed it for a good purpose. And you choose to continue on the broad road to your own destruction because of the sin that's in your heart. I think you can see what's implicit in this as the evangelism of Jonathan Edwards to which we will be coming later. Not for long now, but in our next lecture, we want to look at what Edwards has to say about creation and providence before we come to the fall of man and the need for redemption and the way of redemption in Christian evangelism.